Hi, financial accounting students. Today we're going to cover chapter 11, which they named proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. Um, I'd like to rename it um, equity section of the balance sheet, which is essentially what we're going to be talking about. The chapter does start out with a comparison of different types of entities. So when you go to organize a new company, you have to decide what type of entity you want to be. And so they're comparing proprietorships, meaning like a sole proprietorship versus a partnership versus a corporation. So what we're talking about is different forms of business organization. So a sole proprietorship is a business owned by a single individual. Um, they say single individual, that's not their dating status, they mean by one individual. However, in community property states, it could be by um, a couple that is married. So potentially it could be two people running a sole proprietorship. A partnership is owned by two or more individuals. Now, they say partnerships require clear agreements about authority, risks, and the sharing of profits and losses. I want to strike the word require, replace that with should have. Anytime you run a business with somebody else, you are by default running a partnership business. And unfortunately, I run into clients, business owners, etc., that don't even know that they have formed a partnership. Um, for example, I'll be asking a tax client, well, is there anything else you want to tell me about? Is there any other income or tax deductions that you can think of for this past year? And they'll say, oh yeah, I forgot to mention to you that um, me and my brother-in-law had this little business operation together, but you know, we didn't make any money, so it's not a big deal. Wait, what? You had a business with somebody else? You, by default, had a partnership. So if you're running a business with somebody else, it's a partnership. Now that's a problem because if you have a partnership, you're required to file a partnership uh, tax return. And you need to get a tax ID number and all kinds of things that you need to get your ducks in a row real quick. So they can't say that partnerships require clear agreements about authority risks and the sharing of profit and losses because apparently people run partnerships all the time unknowingly. But let me emphasize, they really should have clear agreements about these things. So here's the thing. Let's say that you and I go into business together. And um, I'm really busy, but I've got some money to invest in the business. So we need $100,000 of money to get the business started. So I put in $75,000 and you put in the other $25,000. Now, I'm really busy, though, so I don't do much of the work and you do most of the work. You do 75% of the work and I only do 25% of the work. Well, it gets to be year end and we've made a profit. Let's say that we made $200,000. How much of that profit is mine? How much is yours? Do you think we're just going to split it 50-50? Maybe. But maybe in my mind, I was thinking, well, I made the $75,000 investment, therefore it's 75% mine. And maybe you're thinking, well, I put in 75% of the work, so it should be 75% mine. Do you see now why we need to have clear agreements about authority, risks, and the sharing of profits and losses. So make sure that if you start a business with somebody else, that you have a professional conversation about how you're going to do these things and answer those questions about what if this and what if that. Take the time to write it out and be mature and professional about it. I know everybody says, don't ever go into business with friends or family. Well, then who do you go into business with? Enemies and strangers, mm, I think we're better off, off with friends and family. But that said, don't let the relationship become too casual. Be professional, be business people, and think through these types of things about sharing of profits and losses and also how to make decisions, meaning authority, and put it in writing in a professional partnership agreement. So next we have corporations, and really our accounting this semester has been focused on corporations, but pretty much everything that you've learned would also apply to a sole proprietorship or a partnership. I mean, the financial statements, debits and credits and all of that, it's pretty much the same regardless of what type or what form of business we're talking about, but we've been focusing on corporations. Um, something to know about a corporation is that it's a separate legal entity and uh, it's created by the authority of a state government. So it varies slightly from state to state, but the key is that it's a separate legal entity, which in 
in a legal way, that means that it's its own separate person. Um, and like I said, each state's going to have different laws governing how to establish and run that corporation. But the key here is that it's a separate legal person, whereas a sole proprietorship and a partnership are not. So that's definitely something to consider if you are thinking about opening a business and you're trying to choose what type of entity should I be, which is a really common question. People ask me this all the time. I'm going to start a business. What type of entity should I be? Should I be a sole proprietorship? Should I be a partnership? Should I be an LLC? They don't even throw that in here. A limited liability company. Should I be a corporation? There's different types of corporations, a C corporation, an S corporation. I won't bore you with the details of all of that. But as you weigh these decisions as to which one is better, you need to consider the legal implications, the tax implications, and simply the day-to-day -day operations and how it would work. Um, as a small business, there's really nothing wrong with any of these forms of business, but do keep in mind that there are some upsides to being a corporation in terms of it being a separate legal entity. When it comes to regulation, there's few laws that govern the operations of sole proprietorships or partnerships, but corporations are subject to regulations. Um, when we say corporations are subject to regulation, that really mostly only applies to large publicly traded corporations. I can tell you firsthand from helping numerous clients over the years run their small corporations that the regulation we're talking about for small corporations is virtually non-existent. It's not difficult. So if you're thinking of starting a business, don't let this whole thing about regulation deter you from choosing a corporation. Um, you need to weigh all the factors, legal, tax, and day-to-day -day operations in making that decision. But regulation really doesn't affect small corporations. Large publicly traded corporations, however, are much more heavily regulated and they have to adhere to the SEC Acts of 1933-34, Sarbanes-Oxley of 2002, and whatever the exchange listing requirements are. When we say large publicly traded corporations, we're talking about companies that sell their stock on a stock exchange. So these are big companies and they're selling stock to pretty much anybody in the world that wants to buy stock on their company. I'm not huge on government regulation and having the government tell us how to do things. I'm not a huge fan of that and I'm not necessarily shy about that, but here's an instance where I really think regulation is important. When somebody invests their money in a company, they need to have confidence that that company is who they say they are, that their financial statements are true, that you know there's some transparency in terms of understanding the operations and finances of the company. And that's why we need regulation of these publicly traded companies in terms of their reporting requirements and adhering strictly to GAAP and all the different accounting rules um, we need to know that their financials are true and correct. So I'm all for regulation of publicly traded corporations because in exchange, there's quite a few advantages. So let's look at some of those advantages. And some of these apply to both large and small corporations. Um, first of all, advantages of a corporation. They're a separate legal entity. So we talked about that already, that um, for example, if somebody wanted to sue a business. If it's a corporation, they're suing that corporation and that's separate from the owners of that corporation. Even if there's only one owner, two owners, they're suing the corporation. However, if I'm running a business as a sole proprietorship and somebody wants to sue my business, they're suing me as well. Me and my sole proprietorship are one and the same. So we need to think about the legal implications of that. A limited liability of stockholders, that goes along with separate legal entity. Continuous life, a corporation has a continuous life. Maybe you hadn't thought much about that before, but what if all of the owners of a corporation die? The corporation lives on. What if all the owners of a sole proprietorship die? The sole proprietorship dies with them. So a little bit different idea, but meaning that it can, the corporation can go on regardless of who its owners are and whether they continue to live. Then these last two, 
these last two bullets under corporate advantages, easily transferable ownership rights and the ability to raise capital. Now these last two mainly apply to large publicly traded corporations. Um, whether the corporation is large or small, the ownership rights are easy to transfer, but agreeing upon a price becomes difficult for smaller corporations. If they're a publicly traded corporation, the price is set by the market, so the stock market. If you want to buy or sell shares in a large publicly traded corporation, it's very easy. Just open up an online brokerage account and you can trade stock. So very easily transferable ownership rights. Now for a small corporation that's not traded on a, on a stock exchange, it is also easy to transfer those ownership rights, but you're gonna spend more time negotiating what's an appropriate price and figuring out a way to verify that. If I told you I'm selling a 10% share in my corporation, would you like to buy it? And you're thinking, well, yeah, I'd like to. Okay, it's $10,000. How do I know it's worth $10,000? Where did I come up with that number? So that's really difficult, where as a publicly traded corporation, the stock market sets that price. Next, we have the ability to raise capital. If I'm talking about a small corporation and I need to raise capital, meaning I need a big inflow of cash to support my business, who am I going to go to? Uh, I can ask my family, I can ask my friends, and Maybe they'll ask one other person. So really, it's people I know and maybe the people that they know. But that's about the extent of my reach in terms of my ability to raise capital as a small corporation. But when we talk about a large publicly traded corporation, then our ability to raise capital uh, really skyrockets. Um, now suddenly the world becomes your audience. Uh, you're trading your stock, your stock sells on a public stock exchange, and anybody in the world can potentially invest in your company. So these last two advantages mainly apply to those large publicly traded corporations. And then they get a, a little bit offset by these corporate disadvantages. First, we have government regulation. So we talked about government regulation already. Um, and again, that mostly applies to large publicly traded corporations. So these last two, this easily transferable ownership rights and the ability to raise capital, that mostly applies to large publicly traded corporations. So if you want those two advantages, then you have to open yourself up to playing by the rules, government regulation. There's gonna be a lot of paperwork, a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of filings, but the advantage is the ability to raise capital, capital and easily transferable ownership rights. Finally, under corporate disadvantages, they list corporate double taxation. And I wanna pause and think about that for a moment. Um, pretty much every textbook, every accounting course always mentions this idea of corporate double taxation. Have you heard that term before? Well, I, wanna, I want you to think critically about it today um, differently than maybe you have in the past. Let me go to a passage in the textbook so I'm looking in your textbook. We're in chapter 11, I think about page 597. I'm in the ebook. And I wanna look at this passage with you about double taxation. And I wanna correct a few things or at least suggest a few things for you to think about. So they say corporations pay income taxes on their earnings and then owners pay income taxes on distributions, which in a corporate environment are called dividends received from the corporation. As a result, distributed corporate profits are taxed twice. First, when income is reported on the corporation's income tax return, and then a second time when distributions are reported on individual owners' tax returns. This phenomenon is commonly called double taxation and is a significant disadvantage of the corporate form of business organization, says the textbook and every textbook I've ever read. But let's talk about that for a minute. First, you know, earlier I said, you know, people ask me all the time, what type of entity should I be? I'm forming a new business. Should I be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, an LLC, a corporation? What should I be? If there was an easy, obvious answer, if there was a massive advantage or disadvantage of one of those forms, then everybody would know that. You would just ask Google. 
you wouldn't go and ask an accountant or an attorney what you should do. You would just Google it and there would be a clear, obvious answer. The reason there's not a clear, obvious answer is that the answer is it depends. And beyond that, this whole thing about this being a significant disadvantage of the corporate form of business organization isn't true. Well, I don't think it's true. Follow my logic here. So let's say that we're talking about a large publicly traded corporation. Let's pick Starbucks. Um, and let's say that they have their corporate net income. So their revenue minus expense equals net income. And that corporate net income closely ties to their taxable income on their tax return. So I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say that it's $10 million. I have no idea. So it's $10 million, and now they have to pay taxes on $10 million. So it's going to be a lot of tax to pay out, right? Now, aside from their net income and paying taxes, if they choose to pay dividends to their shareholders, then those shareholders, let's say that they pay out $2 million in dividends to their shareholders during the year. So now those shareholders are going to have to pay tax on the dividends that they received. But those are individual investors that invested their money in Starbucks, and now they're making money. They actually receive dividends. If you invested your money in a bank account and you earned interest on it, you would pay taxes on the interest you earned. So here, this, here are these individual owners that have invested in Starbucks. They own a share of stock, and they receive dividends during the year. And they're going to have to pay tax on the dividends that they actually received in return for their investment. So I want to be very thoughtful here. They say that there's this thing called corporate double taxation. How many times did the corporation pay tax? Just once. And then people who were rewarded with dividends and actually received dividends, individual investors actually received dividends back from the corporation, they have to pay tax on that and they get they pay tax once. So the corporation pays its tax once. Individual owners that in fact receive dividends, they pay tax just once. So there is no corporate double taxation, but the argument is that corporate profits are taxed twice. So of that $10 million, if two million of it was paid out in dividends, they're saying that two million part would be subject to tax twice because dividends are not an expense. Have you heard that phrase before? I think we've heard that once or twice. Dividends are not an expense and therefore they don't reduce the taxable income at the corporate level. So the corporation has to pay the same tax whether they pay dividends or not. So really this whole thing about corporate double taxation is large corporations whining that dividends are not an expense. Hmm, I'm not really feeling sad for them. Well, you know, maybe if an individual investor just owns maybe 50 or 100 shares in Starbucks, it's not a big deal, it's not a ton of dividends, and it's not a ton of tax. What if you're the CEO and you have millions of shares and you receive a ton of dividends and now you're paying a lot of tax? You know what? I'm not really crying a river for that person either because they're the CEO of a major pub publicly traded corporation and I'm just not feeling sad for them. That's how the tax law works. So the corporation pays its tax, dividends are not an expense, and then the people that receive the dividends pay tax on the dividends that they receive. Let's take it to a small business level though. Let's say that you are running a small uh, corporation. It can be a coffee shop, just like Starbucks, just a little bit smaller, right? And you're the sole owner of that corporation. And during the year, your corporation had net income of $100,000 and you have to file your corporate tax return and pay taxes on $100,000. And then separately, the corporation paid you personally dividends and now you have to pay tax on the dividends that you received. Hmm, that doesn't feel so good now. You're closely related to both of these. You're, you are, it does feel like you're paying taxes twice. But here's the thing. When it comes to small corporations with even the smallest amount of tax planning, working with an accountant, you don't issue dividends to yourself. You put yourself on payroll. You're spending your time running this corporation 
And therefore, as the owner, you are perfectly allowed to be on payroll. And guess what? Payroll is an expense and would reduce the taxable income of the corporation. Um, so dividends are not an expense, but at a small corporation, you would not pay yourself via dividends. You would put yourself on payroll. You would receive a salary and you would appropri appropriately plan maybe a year-end bonus to balance out and minimize tax due between the corporation and yourself. So with a small amount of tax planning from a qualified accountant, there's really no reason to have double taxation on a small business level. It doesn't need to exist there. If you wanna get really technical, when we talk about double taxation, I think double taxation becomes the most real when we're talking about sole proprietorships. So do you remember way back in chapter nine, we were talking about payroll a bit. I wanna show you why I think double taxation affects sole proprietorships the most, in fact, not corporations. Um, back in chapter nine, we learned a little bit about payroll and payroll taxes. And we learned that both the employee and the employer have to contribute to social security, SS, and Medicare. And the, the correct percentages are 6.2 from the employee and the employer for Social Security and 1.45% from the employee and the employer for Medicare. So that's 7.65%. So $7.65 on each $100 of payroll then has to go to the government to fund these programs. So they're each putting in their share. So all total, that's 15.3%. Well, when it comes to a sole proprietorship, a sole proprietorship is considered one and the same with the individual running it. And when they file their tax return, they file um, their form 1040, just like, right, like most individuals, but then they attach what's called a Schedule C, which is the profit or loss from your sole proprietorship business. So it's essentially like an income statement for your small business. And you do revenue minus expense, and then at the bottom, you essentially arrive at your taxable income, which is quite similar to your net income. And you have to pay tax at your ordinary income tax rate on that amount, and it ties right into your 1040. Well, then beyond paying tax on your net income at your ordinary income tax rate, they also then slap on this thing called self-employment tax. So self-employment tax is in addition to your ordinary income tax on your business earnings, and it equals 15.3%. Hmm, is that a coincidence? 15.3% for self-employment tax. Well, what it represents is the employee and the employer contributions to Social Security and Medicare. If, if you're a sole proprietorship, Who's going to contribute to Social Security and Medicare for you? You're both employee and the employer of yourself. And therefore, you get to contribute all of it. So that's what self-employment tax represents. Uh, is there a way around it? Mm, not really. You could reduce the net income in your business by paying yourself payroll. But guess what? Then you're going to have to pay payroll taxes as both the employee and the employer and there it adds up to 15.3% again. So self-employment tax is essentially capturing the payroll taxes that you essentially don't end up paying as a sole proprietorship. Um, and again, I go back to what I said earlier. If there is any obvious answer as to which form of business was the most advantageous, then we would just ask Google. You wouldn't have to ask an accountant or an, or an attorney for advice on this. But the answer goes back to, it depends. It depends on what your situation is. It depends on the business. It depends on the rest of your financial life. Um, so there is no one easy answer. But I can assure you that all these different advantages and disadvantages kind of weigh out evenly because if they didn't, then everybody would either be doing one thing or avoiding one thing because there would be some significant advantage or disadvantage. So back here in our chapter 11 slides, next time you hear the terminology corporate double taxation, I do want you to think critically about that. And if you do think it's a real disadvantage to a corporation, is it bad and wrong and unfair that dividends are not an expense? So 
Anyhow, next time you hear that terminology, maybe in another class or in the business world, I challenge you to think about it and maybe weigh in on it if you don't really think it exists. Corporate management structure. So in terms of the structure of a corporation, there's stockholders that own voting shares of stock, and those stockholders elect the board of directors, and that board of directors can be made up of internal managers and even external non-managers, people from the outside that are essentially acting as um, consultants to the company. And then uh, the board of directors then appoints a president of the company. And then here's just some samples of different vice president positions that a company might see. Um, these aren't required by any stretch. They're just I an idea of uh, different vice president titles that you might see. Now, when we talk about electing um, a board of directors, so these stockholders, share shareholders or stockholders that own voting shares of stock, they get to elect the board of directors. Now, I will be the first one to tell you when it comes to voting, anybody that has the right to vote, absolutely, I feel it's very important that they should educate themselves and vote how they, how they feel. Um, but when it comes to corporate voting, when we talk about stockholders and voting, um, quite honestly, I think it's a big giant waste of time. Any corporation that lets their shareholders uh, really vote, in my opinion, is doing it wrong. And what that means is that a corporation most likely has control of more than 50% of the shares of stock and therefore can control the vote and that you know, if, if the shareholders want to vote Mickey Mouse onto the board of directors, they're really not going to allow that to happen because there's a certain group of people that own 50% or more of the stock in the company and Mickey Mouse is not going to make the ballot. I hear people say, well, that's not fair. These big, mean Wall Street corporations don't let the shareholders have a say. So let's talk for a minute. When it comes to investing in companies, first of all, don't invest your money in companies that you don't like and don't respect. Or know that you don't like them and don't respect them, but just use them to make money for you. But you don't invest your money in a company with the idea that you're going to change them and change their company culture and change the world by investing in this company. That's not the right way to go about it. So if you don't like the company and how they're being run, just don't buy stock. If you're a stockholder in a corporation, don't be disappointed that you only own a few shares of stock relative to maybe the millions of shares that are out there and that your voice is tiny relative to the rest of the shareholders. So the idea that you're going to be able to elect who you want onto this board of directors is probably unrealistic and mathematically a bit naive. So keep in mind that the corporation is going to maintain control of enough shares of stock that they're going to control the vote. So Wasting your time with voting for the board of directors is probably not worth it. So when we talk about capital structure, um, we've been talking about corporations all semester. So when we talk about the ownership interest um, in a corporation, we refer to that as stock. All semester, we've been talking about common stock, but today we're going to learn that there's more than just common stock. There's other types of stock like preferred stock. We'll also learn about treasury stock. And when it comes to our earnings, we have a retained earnings account, so we keep a separate account for that. And then distributions for a corporation are called dividends. But what about sole proprietorships and partnerships? So when it comes to a sole proprietorship, there'll be a single capital account for the owner that represents their investment in the company. And then to the extent that they take distributions from the proprietorship, it's called a withdrawal. So they have owner's investments and owner withdrawals. When it comes to a partnership, there should be a capital account for each of the partners. And so we'll have you know, partners capital Joe, partners capital Sally, par partners capital Bob, and we'll list out each of the partners and their investment. And then separately, we'll have another account for their distributions, which we would call withdrawals. And again, we might list those separately by each partner's name. What's different is that Sole proprietorships and partnerships don't have retained earnings. So 
They don't have an account called retained earnings. They handle that a little bit differently. If you took bookkeeping prior to this course, you might have a grasp on how that's dealt with, but I just want to focus in on the corporate form where we uh, summarize our earnings into our retained earnings account. So we need to look at the characteristics of capital stock, which we can use that term to replace what we thought of as common stock all semester long. We, we started calling it common stock back in chapter one, and we've just stuck with that. And I think today you'll see that we should be grateful that we only knew about common stock all semester long uh, until now. And specifically, we were thinking, it, thinking of it as common stock with no par value. So what is this par value they speak of? Par value is a nominal amount. So nominal has a couple of different meanings. One meaning small or trivial. Um, another one meaning in name only. And I would go with, with that second one. The par value of a stock really doesn't mean anything. It's in name only. And then secondly, legal capital. So legal capital is the amount of capital required by the state of incorporation that must remain invested in the business. But hold on, I want to get some things clarified about par value because this isn't telling you the whole picture here. So in here in your textbook on page 601, it talks about par value. It says many states require assigning a par value to stock. Historically, not presently, historically, par value represented the maximum liability of the investors. Par value multiplied by the number of shares of stock issued represented the minimum amount of assets that must be retained in the company as protection for creditors. This amount was known as legal capital. To ensure that the amount of legal capital is maintained in a corporation, many states require that purchasers pay at least the par value for a share of stock initially purchased from a corporation. To minimize the amount of assets that owners must maintain in the business, many corporations issue stock with very low par values, often a dollar or less. Okay, so hold on. They did the math and like, wait a minute. So if we have a higher number for par val value, then we have to have more legal capital. But, you know, we could just pick a dollar or we could even pick a penny and call that our par value. And then we'd have a, a lower requirement for legal capital. Yeah, that's right. So they just did some basic math and said, well, wait a minute, then we're just going to go as low as we can on par value. So therefore, legal capital as defined by par value has come to have very little or even no relevance to investors or creditors. As a result, many states allow corporations to issue what's called no par stock. So what you're going to find out is that we've been assuming all semester long that when we issue stock, it's no par stock. Um, bigger picture, as we talk about par value, I don't know how to explain it to you any better than this. And the sooner that you believe me on this, the better. Par value is a meaningless, arbitrary figure, but we use it. It's a meaningless, arbitrary figure, but we use it. So it's in name only. We just discussed the idea that it really doesn't mean anything in terms of legal capital anymore. Um, like I said, some states don't require par value, so we call that no par stock. And really what you're going to find out is that par value is just a big giant pain in the rear. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't enhance our understanding of the corporation and its financial situation. And it really just makes a big giant mess of the balance sheet. So here they say par value is an arbitrary amount. Even our brilliant textbook is admitting that par value is an arbitrary amount assigned to each share of stock when it's authorized. So to the extent that par value ever equals market price, that's just a coincidence. Market price is something separate. It's the amount that each share of stock will sell for in the market, and that market price is determined by the market. So like I said, if they ever equal each other, it's merely a coincidence. So big picture, when we talk about the stock of a company, when a corporation is formed, they have to determine the number of shares of stock authorized. And they might say, well, you know, um, let's say me and the rest of you, the 30 of us are forming this corporation and therefore we only need 30 shares of stock. Mm, that might be a little short-sighted. Just pick a big number. It's okay. How about a million shares of stock? 
There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to issue all of them. It's just the maximum number of shares of capital stock that can be sold to the public. So we can have a million shares authorized and only issue 30 of them to me and the rest of you. So if this whole box here, I know there's all kinds of words already in the way, but if this whole box here represents all of our authorized stock, all of that stock starts out over here on the unissued side. So all million shares would start here. As we issue stock, those shares would become outstanding. So our 30 shares would go from being unissued over to outstanding stock. So those 30 shares would move from unissued over to outstanding stock. And then we have this concept of treasury stock. So treasury stock is stock that that has been issued but then reacquired by the corporation. So I want to take another look at this box overall. So the whole thing represents all of the shares of stock authorized. But those shares start out here as unissued. As they become issued, they go over to outstanding. They can never move back to being unissued. This is a one-way street, okay? So Unissued stock is stock that has never been sold. So the stock is outstanding. It could trade hands countless times, be sold to other people over and over and over. But it's still outstanding and never becomes unissued. Then we have this concept of treasury stock that we need to learn about. And that's when the corporation reacquires its own stock. So the stock then moves from being outstanding down to treasury stock. So it's still outstanding, excuse me, it's still issued, but it's not outstanding. When I think of treasury stock, I think that it's instanding. It's being held internally. So big picture with the box. The whole box is our authorized shares with our unissued shares on the right and our issued shares on the left. And then within issued shares, there's outstanding stock that's owned by stockholders. And then there's treasury stock, which is held by the corporation internally. So all semester long, we've been talking about common stock as if it's the only type of stock that exists. But really, we should probably call it capital stock. And then within capital stock, we've got common stock and preferred stock. So today we'll learn the differences between the two. So common stock. When it comes to common stockholders, they've got the right to buy and sell the stock, which is how they became common stockholders, share in the distribution of profits, which we refer to as dividends. Number three, share in the distribution of assets in the case of liquidation. Well, you shouldn't buy stock hoping for that. If a company's liquidating, that's pretty bad. And as a stockholder, you're not likely to get anything. So. Don't hold your breath for number three, and if you think a company is going to liquidate, you probably don't want to buy their stock. Number four, vote on significant matters that affect the corporate charter. And number five, participation, participate in the election of directors. Uh, to be quite honest, number four and five, we talked about that earlier, that most smart corporations are not going to let the average stockholders vote really matter. They're going to maintain control of 50% or more of the voting stock so that they control who's elected on the board of directors and they control significant matters. Like I mentioned earlier, some people think that that's outrageous that corporations do that. Um, it's really a, a matter of you know, the amount of investment in the company and controlling shares of stock. Um, but if you really think about it, do you want the average investor, maybe somebody who knows nothing about the business or nothing about the industry, to make significant decisions in terms of who and how the corporation is going to operate? I don't think it's a very good idea. Um, if you don't like the way the company operates, then you probably shouldn't invest in the company. So anyhow, four and five probably aren't that relevant. Number three, as we mentioned, don't hold your breath, breath for that. If the corporation is liquidating, as a stockholder, you're probably not going to get much in terms of the distribution of assets. So this would be a pretty bad situation with number three. So the main thing as a common stockholder is you want to be able to buy and sell stock, hopefully buy low and sell high to make some money. 
And number two, share in the distribution of profits, which is dividends. So that's our main two ways of making money in buying common stock. So buy low, sell high, we hope, if things work out, and hopefully receive some dividends along the way. Preferred stock is a little bit different in that it has priority over the common stock in terms of dividend distribution and distribution of assets in the case of liquidation. Again, when we're talking about liquidation, uh, let's not focus on that because that's going to be a desperate situation and probably stockholders aren't going to get much at all. So really the key thing here with preferred stock is that it has priority in dividend distribution. So typically preferred stock is going to have a stated dividend rate. They'll state it in the form of a percentage, but it typically doesn't have any voting rights. So they give up their voting rights for priority in terms of dividends. Well, probably not a big deal because we didn't really care about the voting rights anyhow. Here they're giving us some data that they say about 25% of corporations offer preferred stock, but the other 75% don't offer preferred stock. And really, I mean, I get students that ask, well, what's the purpose of preferred stock? Well, it's to attract a different type of investor, um, somebody different that wants to invest their money into the corporation. Maybe they're looking for a more steady dividend payout. Um, so it's a different way of raising capital for the corporation, attracts a different group of investors, but also keep in mind, no voting rights. So the corporation might have a delicate balance of maintaining control over enough shares of its, enough of the common shares so that it has voting control, but they need a new influx of capital. So they might issue a different type of stock, preferred stock or a different class of stock that has no voting rights so they can raise capital and have stockholders without throwing off the voting rights. When it comes to preferred stock, there's two different types, cumulative and non-cumulative. So cumulative preferred stock means that dividends in arrears, arrears means dividends that we're behind on. We call that an arrearage or uh, in arrears. So those dividends that we're behind on must be paid before dividends can be paid to common stockholders. In contrast, non-cumulative preferred stock means undeclared dividends from current and prior years do not have to be paid in future years. Most preferred stock is cumulative. That's what would attract somebody to want to buy preferred stock is that they have this priority in terms of dividends. They're going to receive their dividends from current year as well as past years before the common stockholders see anything. Let's look at an example. Dillon Inc. has the following stock outstanding. Preferred stock, 4%, $10 par, 10,000 shares. Common stock, $10 par, 20,000 shares. Hey, what about that par value? I thought you said we weren't going to use that. Mm, no, I said it's meaningless and arbitrary, but we use it. So you're going to see that happen here. So we've got preferred stock and common stock, and they tell us that dividends have not been paid in two years. In the current year, the board of directors declared dividends of 22,000. How much will each class of stock receive? Well, is it cumulative or non-cumulative? So if it's cumulative, we take that total dividend declared, and then we subtract what we have to pay to the preferred stockholders. And to compute the dividend, we take par, times percentage, times shares. Again, to compute a dividend, and this will be the same every time, par times percentage times shares. So we take $10 par times 4% times 10,000 shares. We have to pay out $4,000 in dividends. Now we're two years in arrears. So we haven't paid dividends for 2018, 2019, and now the current year is 2020. So we have to go back and pay $4,000 of dividends for 2018, another $4,000 for 2019, and now $4,000 for 2020. So the first $12,000 is going to the preferred stockholders, and to the extent that there's leftovers, then that goes to the common stockholders, the remaining $10,000. What do you think it'll look, at, look like if it's non-cumulative? If it's non-cumulative, do we have to go back and pay the arrearage for 2018 and 2019? Nope, I hope you were picturing something like this. So we don't have to go back and pay the prior years. So the preferred stockholders will get 4,000 and then the rest, the remaining 18,000, a lot more, 
now goes to the common stockholders. So there's different types of stock. I mentioned that a corporation might issue different types of stock so that it can have more, it can, uh, it can get more capital without necessarily losing its voting rights uh, or losing control of those voting rights. So we're gonna go through various different types of stock that a company can issue, including um, common stock, par value, no par, other classes of stock. Okay, so here we have Nelson Incorporated. They issued 100 shares of common stock $10 par value for $22 per share. So way back in chapter one, we learned how to issue stock where we just debit cash and credit common stock. But now you're gonna see what I mean about arbitrary value being a real pain in the hiney. Uh, our, excuse me, par value being a real pain in the hiney. It's completely arbitrary. It doesn't mean anything. So like I said, par value is a meaningless arbitrary amount, but we use it. So. Here's where it's gonna make a mess out of what used to be a very simple journal entry. So we take 100 shares times $22 per share is $2,200. So we debit cash for the full 2,200. But then we can only credit common stock for up to $10 of par. So 100 shares times $10 of par, then we get $1,000 there. The rest, anything above $10, the difference between 22 and 10, the extra $12, goes into paid in capital in excess of par, common stock, $10 par. That's a long account title, right? Sometimes we abbreviate that to PIC, meaning paid in capital, or how I learned it in school was we called it APIC, additional paid in capital. So we said APIC, common stock. This text calls it paid in capital in excess of par, which is fine, um, but that's yet another equity account. So we've got a new equity account. So anytime we have stock with a par value, there's likely also going to be a paid in capital in excess of par account that goes with it. So a little bit more complicated, but essentially we're just breaking out the par value and anything beyond the par value when we record that issuance of the stock. <clears throat> so here's another one. Assume that Nelson has another class of common stock, $20 par value class B. So they have a different class of stock, maybe because they wanted to raise more capital without throwing off the voting balance of their regular common stock. That's a possibility. Um, so the company issues 150 shares of class B common stock at $25 per share. So again, par value, meaningless and arbitrary, but we use it. So our cash amount will be 150 shares times $25 a share. So we're gonna debit cash for 37.50. What we put into common stock, the credit can only be 150 shares times $20 par. So that's the $3,000 credit. And then anything above that, that difference of $5 per share times 150 shares is 750. That extra goes into yet another new equity account called paid in capital in excess of par, common stock class B, $20 par. Again, a long account title. They didn't even include the full account title here, but that's what it would look like. So we're just splitting out the credits between common stock and paid in capital in excess. We do it again. This time it's preferred stock. Assume that Nelson issues 100 shares of 7% cumulative preferred stock with a stated value of $10 per share at a price of $22 per share. So again, we take 100 shares times $22. So our cash will be a debit of 2,200. Then the amount that can go into preferred stock is $10 par value. And while we're talking about preferred stock, a lot of times with preferred stock, they'll say stated value Par value and stated value pretty much mean the same thing. Again, both meaningless and arbitrary, but we use it. So we put 100 shares times $10, so $1,000 into preferred stock. So that's a credit to preferred stock. And then the difference between 22 and 10, there's an extra $12 in there. $12 times 100 shares, the extra 1,200 goes into yet another new equity account called paid in capital in excess of par preferred stock. $10, $10 par value or stated value, right? They said stated value here, then par value here. How about this one? 
this is what we like. This is how we did it all semester long up until this chapter. We assumed that there was no par. Assume that Nelson issues 100 shares of no par common stock at a price of $22 per share. So we take 100 shares times $22 is 2200 We debit cash, we credit common stock. Yes, that's how we do it. All the rest of this, in my opinion, is just extra clutter. Look what it does to our balance sheet. Our stockholders equity section used to be really simple. Um, here it's become unnecessarily complicated and in my opinion, really just makes it harder for the readers of the financial statements to find any meaning. So in the equity section of the balance sheet, um, we list our stock in proper order. Well, what does that mean? Well, preferred stock comes first because it's preferred. And then you have your regular common stock and then common stock class B and then common stock no par. So these are listed in a particular order for a reason. And then we list the paid in capital accounts in that same order beneath it. So preferred came first and then common and then common class B. So we do paid in capital in excess of stated value preferred and then common and then common class B. So the paid in capital goes down at the bottom in the same order in which we listed the stocks above. And then all of that together is what we call our total paid in capital. If you're the reader of the financial statement, what does this actually tell you though? Knowing that par or stated value are meaningless arbitrary figures, not a whole lot. If I want to know what they initially issued their preferred stock for, I'd have to add up the 1,000 plus the 1,200. Um, so it really just kind of makes a mess. It doesn't really give any usable information to the readers of the financial statements. As another note, as we look at this balance sheet, um, all of this information that they've put in here is required. So preferred stock, $10 stated value, 7% cumulative, 300 shares authorized, 100 mm -hmm. issued and outstanding. That's a lot of detail for each of these and that's required here. So our next topic is treasury stock, which we mentioned briefly before. Um, we were talking about um, shares authorized and how many are outstanding, how many have been issued, so those topics. And we talked about treasury stock briefly in that context, but we need to learn a little bit more about treasury stock here. So first thing is treasury stock has no voting or dividend rights. So again, treasury stock is when the corporation reacquires shares in itself. So shares that were issued and now have been reacquired by the corporation. So those shares don't have voting rights, but they take that vote away from somebody else potentially. So um, for example, if there's 100 shares of stock outstanding in the company and we know who owns 75 of them and they're going to vote a particular way to get the right people on the board of directors. Well, what if one of those stockholders decides that they want to sell their share of stock to some other random people, just other outside investors? And others start selling shares of stock and we get pretty close to that 50-50 mark where we only own 50 shares. We might start getting a little bit nervous. So rather than letting these existing shareholders sell their share of stock to some outside person, maybe the corporation wants to reacquire those shares itself. And while it doesn't have voting rights, it doesn't let somebody else vote. So it reduces the overall number of votes. Um, treasury stock itself is a contra equity account, meaning a negative equity, an equity that carries a debit balance. And then this sentence down here at the bottom, stick this little nugget away in your head. We're gonna use it in a few minutes, not yet. Uh, when stock is reacquired, the corporation records the treasury stock at cost. So remember that we're going to record it at cost. So there's no voting or dividend rights. So why would a company buy its own stock back? Well, we've talked about some of the reasons already um, in preparation for a merger or to avoid a hostile takeover. I know those sound like different things. But essentially what we're talking about here, preparing for a merger and avoiding a hostile takeover, is the voting balance. Um, do we have enough votes? Do we control enough votes that we're going to be able to control who is appointed 
onto the board of directors, who is the president of the company, and how is the company going to be run? Or has somebody else gathered up enough votes that they're going to take over our company? So that's what we mean by a hostile takeover. Um, when you think of a hostile takeover in this context, we're not talking about people with guns and masks rushing corporate headquarters and taking it over in that way. It simply means that people have gained control of the voting shares of stock and they're going to change up the management of the company. And that's the same idea with the merger. We need to have enough votes uh, go the way we want them if we decide that we're going to merge with another company. So the second one and the fifth one are all about controlling the votes. How about these other reasons? Employee stock option plans. Have you heard of employee stock options before? Um, sometimes you hear that term and you don't necessarily know what it means. Um, stock options are often used as part of a compensation package. So rather than uh, paying an employee more, giving them a raise or a higher salary, sometimes the company will offer them stock options. And what that means is that they're not giving them stock, but they're giving them an option, an opportunity to buy stock in the company at a reduced price. And then the idea being that they would be able to buy it at a reduced price and then sell it at a higher price and make money. Uh, why would a company do that? Well, the idea is that if the employees are literally invested in the company, that they feel more connection with their job. They might work harder. They might care more about the work that they're doing. They might make better decisions and help the company advance if they literally have an investment in the company. Um, it's not just a job to them. It's not just a paycheck uh, that they actually care about the outcomes of the company. So that's the idea. But in order to sell employees shares of stock at a reduced price, they have to be selling it from their treasury stock. So they have to have ample treasury stock on hand in order to do that. So that's the idea with stock options. Um, this next one, to increase earnings per share and supporting the stock price. These kind of go hand in hand. So when we say to increase earnings per share, so earnings per share would be our net income divided by the number of shares of stock outstanding. If we reduce the number of shares of stock outstanding, it's gonna make our earnings per share go up. Here, let me show you. So what I was just saying is that earnings per share, we take our net income divided by the number of shares outstanding. So if our net income is a million, a million dollars, and we've got a million shares of stock outstanding, then our earnings per share is a dollar per share, right? That could be dollar. So that's our piece of the pie, essentially. Well, if the company decides to buy back, let's say they buy back 200,000 shares of stock to hold as treasury stock, then what happens? So they buy back 200,000 shares, so there would only be 800,000 shares outstanding. Now look what happens. Our earnings per share goes up to $1.25. So our, our piece of the pie just got bigger. Um, some would say that the company has bought back treasury stock and has manipulated the earnings per share. Um, the word manipulated sure has a negative connotation to it, but they didn't literally mathematically manipulate it, but the reality is, is that net income, that million dollars of net income only has to be shared among 800,000 friends now rather than a million. So our earnings per share really did go up. Did the company manipulate it? Well, they used real money to buy back those shares of stock. So it does increase the earnings per share. They may have done that intentionally, but it's not fake or false or misleading. Some will say that they've manipulated it, but um, your earnings per share really just got higher. <clears throat> and then one of the other reasons that they mentioned is supporting the stock price. So at the same time that we have caused earnings per share to go up by buying back stock, this supports the stock price. And here's how. First of all, anytime a company wants uh, a company buys back stock. So does the stock buyback or a treasury stock, um, there's a few different terms that you'll hear for a treasury stock buyback. Um, anytime a company does that, it's usually perceived as a sign of strength. 
first, in order to do that, they have to have ample cash on hand to buy those shares of stock back. So they have to have cash flow to manage that. So that's a sign of strength. Secondly, it's perceived as a sign of strength in that um, people don't believe the company would buy stock in itself if they believe that the company is performing poorly and is headed downhill. They would buy its own stock because the company itself believes that it's doing well and is going to see success in the near future and that the stock price is going to go up. Whether or not that's true, we don't know, but it's perceived as a sign of strength. But then beyond that, mathematically and considering that supply and demand, it also supports the stock price. So if we go back to my example here in Excel, um, the number of shares outstanding, when we bought, bought back 200,000 shares, that's our supply of shares on the market. So supply has gone down. You guys know a little bit about economics, supply, demand, and price. Um, so the supply of stock on the market has gone down from a million to 800,000 shares. At the same time, it's caused earnings per share to go up. Well, a higher earnings per share is going to create more demand for the stock. So supply is down, demand is up, and naturally, according to the laws of economics, that would cause the price to go up. So supply is down, there's less available, demand is up because the earnings per share looks better, and that causes the stock price to go up. So some will say that buying back treasury stock and the stock price going up is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, um, if that makes any sense. So let's look at the nuts and bolts of how this happens in terms of debits and credits. So assume that Nelson paid $20 per share to buy back 50 shares of the $10 par value stock that it originally issued at a price of $22 per share. So we take 50 shares times $20 per share, and we're going to debit our new contra equity account called treasury stock for $1,000 and we credit cash $1,000. So remember, we're recording treasury stock at cost, right? It cost us $20. It doesn't matter that the original issue price was 22. It doesn't matter that it has a $10 par. We record treasury stock at cost. So then a little later, assume that Nelson resells 30 shares of its treasury stock at a price of $25 per share. So the price of the stock has gone up, so that's good. So initially we had 50 shares at 20, now we're reselling 30 of those shares at 25. So 30 times 25 is 750. So we're going to receive $750. And then we have to remove the treasury stock from the treasury stock account at cost. So 30 times the cost of $20 per share so we credit treasury stock. So what's left in treasury stock is 20 more shares at $20 per share. But we get rid of the 30 shares at 20 per share. And then that difference between 25, the selling price today, and what we bought it for, that difference of $5 goes into a new account called paid in capital in excess of treasury stock. So that's $5 times 30 shares is $150. So paid in capital in excess of cost treasury stock. Essentially, it looks like we bought the stock for 20 and then we sold it for 25. So it kind of feels like we have a gain on the sale of the treasury stock. Mm -hmm. But there is no such thing as a gain or loss on the sale of treasury stock. But it kind of feels like there is, right? But we call that paid in capital and excess of treasury stock. <coughs> so our next topic is dividends and understanding how dividends affect our financial statements. The first thing to know is that corporations are not required to pay dividends ever. They don't have to. Um, a lot of large publicly traded companies get pressure from analysts and stockholders to pay dividends, but if that's not what they want to do with their cash, then they certainly don't have to. Um, a company that received a lot of heat over the years for not paying dividends is Apple. Um, they were, obviously have been very successful over the years financially, they had tons of cash on hand, and analysts and stockholders kept saying, issue dividends, pay dividends to the stockholders. And the company says, no thanks, we're fine. People seem to invest in our company. We're showing them, uh, we're showing them that we can make money and they're being rewarded in the stock price, um, dramatically increasing over the years. And rather than paying a small dividend to the stockholders, some companies prefer to keep that cash internally 
and use it. Use it for new product development, use it for new ideas, use it for expansion. So rather than pay out a small dividend to the stockholders, which may not mean a whole lot, they want to keep the cash and use it wisely for their operations and show the stockholders growth in a different way, which is by um, increasing their net income and seeing their stock value grow that way. So once a company does declare dividends, then the dividend becomes a legal obligation. But prior to that point of declaring dividends, they're not required to pay a dividend at all ever. So there's three dates that you need to be aware of. We have the declaration date, and that's the date at which we need to record the liability for that dividend. We're not actually going to pay it that day, just that we have a liability. Um, secondly, the date of record, which for you, there's nothing to record at the date of record. So no entries required. It's kind of a behind the scenes thing. And then finally, there's the payment date. So that's when they actually pay those dividends and relieve the liability from the declaration date. So let's see how it works. So at the declaration date, on October 15th, year two, Nelson's board of directors declared a cash dividend on the 100 outstanding shares of its 7% $10 par preferred stock. The dividend will be paid on December 15th to stockholders of record on November 15th. So here we need to record the liability. We're not gonna pay it yet, but we need to record the liability. So to compute our dividend, we take percentage times par times shares. We're paying out a whopping $70 of dividends. So we're gonna debit dividends and credit dividends payable. So that's a new liability account. We don't mix it in with our other liabilities. <clears throat> then we've got the date of record. So it's November 15th and we don't have to record anything at November 15th, but what happens is that the company needs to do some behind the scenes work and figure out who is the rightful owner of the stock as of today, November 15th, because that's who's gonna receive the dividend. The stock could trade hands hundreds of times between October 15th and November 15th, but whomever owns it on November 15th will be the rightful recipient of those dividends. So no entry, but some work behind the scenes. And then finally at the payment date, so now it's December 15th and we're gonna pay out that dividend. We relieve the liability, so we're debiting dividends payable and we're crediting cash. And that's it. Next, we've got stock dividends and stock splits. Um, a stock dividend is when the company wants to pay a dividend to its shareholders, but instead of giving them cash, they give them shares of stock or even fractional shares of stock. So it's a distribution of additional shares of stock to the stockholders. And what happens is no change in total stockholders equity, no change in the par value. Well, that's fine because we didn't care about it anyhow. And then finally, all stockholders retain the same percentage of ownership. So let's see an example of this. Nelson's board of directors decided to issue a 10% stock dividend on the 150 outstanding shares of its $20 par value Class B common stock. So 10% stock dividend on the Class B stock, there's 150 shares. Market value at the time of the stock dividend was $30 per share. Now, a lot of times we don't care about market value in accounting, right? But in this case we do because we need to understand the value of the stock that we're about to give away. We're literally giving away some stock. So we need to understand what it's worth. So we're gonna be debiting retained earnings, which that in itself is weird. Um, mathematically, what we're doing is 10% stock dividend times 150 shares times $30 per share market value is $450. We're debiting retained earnings. Now, way back in chapter three, when we were learning debits and credits and using T accounts and closing entries and all that, I told you, you really should not be debiting or crediting retained earnings outside of closing entries. Well, here is exception number one. <laughs> we're all the way in chapter 11 and here's exception one where you do find yourself debiting retained earnings outside of a closing entry. So again, that was the 10% dividend, so 0 0.1 times 150 shares outstanding times the $30 market price per share is $450. So we are unretaining 
$450 of our retained earnings. We're giving it to the stockholders. And we're going to then credit common stock for the par value. So the par value is 10% times 150 shares times $20 par, that's 300. And then the paid in capital in excess is that difference. Or really, you could look at the difference between $20 par and the $30 market price. So we're crediting common stock class B and we're crediting paid in capital in excess of par, just as we would if somebody had paid cash for the stock, but we're not receiving cash. We're giving it away to our stockholders for free. So it reduces our retained earnings. So the journal entry moves an amount from retained earnings into our other equity accounts. It doesn't change the overall equity in the company, but it shifts it from being retained to being um, common stock. Next, we have stock splits. So the idea with a stock split is that it replaces existing shares with a greater number of new shares. And a company might use a stock split to reduce their market price per share of their outstanding stock. Well, why would a company wanna do that? I thought the idea was that we want the stock price to go from low to high. But doesn't there come a point where the stock price might be so high that people can't afford to invest in your company? A basic rule of thumb is that investors like to buy stocks with double digit prices. And I'm not saying this is rational. This is just a basic rule of thumb and involves some psychology here. But investors like to buy stocks with double digit prices. Um, if, the pri if the price of the stock is single digits, for some reason they think that that's too low and too close to zero and that, that the company's not successful. Well, we know from learning about PE ratio and earnings per share, that's not quite how it works. Um, so a low stock price doesn't mean that it's unsuccessful or it's going to zero. Um, but regardless, investors like double digit stock prices. Um, they also don't like it when the stock price is really high because it feels too expensive to them that they're not buying many shares of stock. If I told you, you have a thousand dollars and you can invest it in the stock market however you see fit. Would you like to buy 10 shares of stock that cost $100 each? Or would you like to buy one share of stock that costs $1,000 per share? Most people are gonna say they'd rather buy 10 shares at $100 each because they feel like they're getting more. But that's not rational. The answer is you should put your money into whatever company you think is going to be most successful. It doesn't matter the market price per share, it matters how much it increases. If both companies increase by 10%, you've made the same amount of money. The only rational argument to buy more shares at a lower price would be not to buy all of them in the same company and to diversify our holdings. So buy five shares in company A at $100 each and then buy 10 shares in company B at $50 each. So um, to diversify our holdings, that would be a rational way of explaining that. But for the most part, we go back to the idea that investors like to buy stocks with double digit prices. So if a company's stock price grows really high, they might use a stock split then to reduce the market price per share. Um, I wanted to take a moment to show you a couple companies with high stock prices and look at their stock splits over the years. So here, let's take a look at Google, one of my favorites, right? $1,388 per share. Um, that's pretty high, right? So they're not really observing that whole double digit price thing. Um, really anymore, sometimes, you know, people don't like stocks above two or 300, but still this is a high stock price. Um, if we look at their stock chart, let's click in here. We can go in here in events and add in this checkbox for stock splits or dividends. And we can then see when they've done a stock split or paid out a dividend. So I need to expand a little bit in order to see it. There it is. Google did a split way back in, sorry, get rid of the extra lines. Uh, Google did a stock split back in 2000. 15 it looks like, so it's been a while. Let's look at another company with some stock splits. 
here we have McDonald's. They've been doing pretty well right up until recently. That's a great line, right? Let's go back even further though. There, they do a stock split. It was a while back, but um, a lot of these companies will split their stock to make the price seem more affordable. I wanna show you a company that doesn't care about how high their stock price gets. Have you heard of the company Berkshire Hathaway? Check this out. <laughs> There's a company that does not care how high their stock price gets. $265,280 per share. Uh, I don't think your average investor is going to be able to afford that. That's a lot. Um, you'd have to save up a lot of money to buy one share of stock, and you'd be putting all your eggs in that one basket. So that is a serious amount of money. Um, and this is a company that says, hey, we don't care. Um, you know, we're going to let our stock price grow and grow and grow. And it is a track record of our success <laughs> over the years. And no need to split. If you can't afford it, then don't buy it. And that's up to you. So over the years, this company has grown, grown, grown quite impressively. It goes way back. Um, pretty incredible, right? Um, but yeah, most people can't ever afford a share of this stock, but it's pretty, pretty incredible run. Um, this is Warren Buffett's company. Have you heard of Warren Buffett? No, nah, not Jimmy Buffett. No Margaritaville. Warren Buffett. If you don't know that name, Google it. It's somebody you should know if you're in the business world. All right, let me get back to chapter 11 here. So again, the idea with the stock split, the company's going to use the stock split to reduce their market price per share to something that they deem more affordable for investors. The number of outstanding shares is going to increase and the par values then decrease proportionately and there's no impact on retained earnings. So let's take a look. Nelson's board of directors declared a two for one stock split on the 165 outstanding shares of $20 par value class B common stock. So before the split, we've got 165 shares, $20 par, so it totals 3,300. So then we do a split, a two for one split. So we take back all 165 shares and we give each of those stockholders two of the new shares. So now we've got 330 shares, but now with a $10 par value. So we cut the par value in half, which is fine because we didn't care about it anyhow. And the total par is still $3,300. So nothing's really changed. Everybody still has the same percentage of ownership in the company, but the stock price is going to also temporarily cut in half when they do the stock split, making the stock more affordable for future investors. So then we get to appropriation of retained earnings. And really all this means is essentially reserving retained earnings. But I want to be really clear on this. Appropriating retained earnings in no way guarantees that we have cash set aside for a special purpose. So they tell us a corporation's directors can voluntarily limit dividends because of a special need for cash. So essentially appropriating retained earnings is a, is a way of sending a message to the shareholders saying, well, hey, this is why we're not issuing any dividends or why we're not issuing more dividends is that we want to reserve some of our cash for this special need. But just appropriating the retained earnings in no way guarantees that the company has cash on hand for that special need. If they want to make sure they have cash on hand, they should move some cash into a separate savings account and not touch it. But it's essentially a way of telling shareholders, hey, this money is reserved and that's why we're not paying it out as dividends. So assume that Nelson's board of directors appropriated $1,000 of retained earnings for future expansion. So we're going to debit retained earnings. Ah, there we are using retained earnings in a journal entry again, right? Exception number two. So we're going to debit retained earnings, removing it from our regular retained earnings account. And then we're going to put it into this new retained earnings account called appropriated retained earnings. And again, appropriated just means reserved, reserved retained earnings, appropriated retained earnings. So we're just shifting it from one retained earnings to another essentially sub account of our retained earnings. So after all of this, let's take another look at our balance sheet. 
Again, it's gotten really scary. The equity section of our balance sheet used to be really simple, short and sweet, and it keeps getting more and more complicated every time I introduce a new topic to you. So again, we list all of our stocks in order, preferred, common, common class B, common no par. Then we list all of our paid in capital accounts, paid in capital in excess of stated value preferred, paid in capital in excess common, paid in, co paid in capital in excess of par class B and so on. Notice we do have paid in capital in excess of cost treasury stock. So that goes up there as well. We get our total paid in capital. And then we have our retained earnings. So under retained earnings, they've broken it out by our appropriated retained earnings, the reserved retained earnings, and then just the rest of it, our regular retained earnings, which is now our unappropriated retained earnings. So we get our total retained earnings of 10,480. And then way down here at the bottom, we have our treasury stock. So we've got less treasury stock, 20 shares at $20 per share. So remember the treasury stock is a contra equity account and it's gonna go down at the bottom beneath the retained earnings. So it's still part of total stockholders equity. It's a negative part that we show at the bottom. Also, I wanna mention if you have 20 shares of treasury stock down here, those 20 shares should be reflected up here. And I just corrected this. It says common stock, $10 par value, 250 shares are authorized, 100 shares have been issued, but 80 are outstanding. Well, where's the other 20? They're down here. They're not outstanding, they're being held internally. So all of that has to add up and make sense. So there's your 20 shares. As you're doing your homework, um, this particular exhibit in your textbook or here in the slides is a good one to refer to in terms of understanding the order in which things should go and where things go in the equity section of the balance sheet because it has suddenly become very complicated. So finally, we take a look at stock and how to make investment decisions. And we've talked about this some in light of your group project. Um, in terms of this course, we don't expect you to be a stock market expert by any stretch, but I want to at least make sure that you understand the two basic ways in which stockholders benefit when the company generates earnings. So one way, the stockholders are hoping that the dividend, that the company might pay out dividends and they'll receive cash dividends, um, or it could even be a stock dividend, but typically we think of cash dividends. So that's one way that stockholders benefit. And then secondly, um, when the company is doing well, hopefully we're going to see an increase in the market price per share, which that means that the stockholders can potentially buy low and sell high, and they can make money on that gap in between. So we want to buy low and sell high. So those are the two basic ways of making money in the stock market. There's definitely more ways of making money in the stock market. Those are not the only two by any stretch, but those are your two basic ways. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about the price earnings ratio, the PE ratio, but rather than lecture on this again, I want to refer you over to the video that I made on PE ratio and understanding PE ratio and stock price as it relates to your group project. So I refer you directly to that video, which you'll also find on YouTube or you'll find a link for it in Canvas. Um, but please do watch that. It's really important information related to P-E ratio and how to interpret that information. And finally, that's it for chapter 11. Whew, that was a long one. A lot of information on a variety of topics in there. Um, please do a lot of time to work through your homework, homework this chapter and study each of these little topics and really take some time to talk with your group about P-E ratio and how you're going to interpret the P-E ratio for the companies that you have selected. All right, you guys, you know where to find me if you need any help. Good luck.